Hello, everyone, and welcome. It is Wednesday. It is the 21st of December, and that's why I have this beautiful tree. Well, which shoulder? It's that shoulder. I have this beautiful tree behind me. So happy holidays to whatever you're celebrating. We are celebrating with the Knowledge Bowl Light crew the colors in meteorites. Today's hangout is a themed hangout on the colors of the rainbow as depicted in meteorites. So we're going to have a scientific explanation with Mike Kelly in our 101, but we're going to jump right into it with a live presentation because not all meteorites are, are all colored and it's really hard to put a show like this together. Really had to call on the crew to bring their collections together to get the colors of the rainbow. But there's one brand new meteorite that Getty's going to tell us about, and it, it, it solves the problem for the show. So Getty, over to you in one second. Getty, what beautiful meteorite did to show us today, buddy? All right, so what I've got right here is a little stone named Rantilla. This is a recent fall from earlier this year, fell on the 17th of August in 2022. Now, Rantilla is a provisional name. It's still in classification, so that might change. Uh, right now, it's a probable Aubright. And so uh, if you want to learn more about the Aubrights, actually, there was a nice little um, Knowledge Bowl I'd hang out back on September 8th, 2021. So go hunt that down, or maybe Cobra can link to that somewhere in here. Uh, but what I have is a 1.72 gram stone. If you want to switch over to the action camera, we can see what's going on with this one. So right now, what we're looking at is the fusion crust of the stone. This is the exterior. And then we can see flipping it over. So what's really great about this stone is it has a ton of crystal structure inside of it. And what we found is that when you hit this with UV light, it actually fluoresces really, really well. So what we're really looking for are various crystals in it. And let's just start on the fusion crust side. Interestingly, there are two crystals poking through the fusion crust, one right there, one, one right there and one there. So what I need to do now is kill all the lights. And then I'm going to bust out my 365 nanometer UV lamp. And you Whoa. can see those two crystals that I just pointed out are actually fluorescing in red. Oh. Wow. All right, very, so that's the start of the rainbow, right? We've got red. Mm -hmm. Let's see what else we can do here. Just a little turn to the side. And there's actually a nice little orange crystal hanging out right there. Uh -huh. Yep. If we go to the other side, <laughs> yellow and orange. Well, that's probably not. There we go. That's a little bit better. Yeah. Wow. But then when we go to the interior, this is where everything pops. Oh, my goodness. And, and the amazing thing about this one is that there are so many different colors. Yeah. To my knowledge, this is the only meteorite I've ever seen this in. That's amazing. I, many people have called it the most fluorescent meteorite that has ever existed. It is impressive. There's some drool going on over here. So, I mean, what do we got? We've got orange, yellow, green up near the top, and then blues and purples at the bottom. They're a little bit harder to see, but they're, I've lost my poking stick. Oh, well, you can <laughs> see them all there. It but to, really to what Pat was saying of all the different colors, that, that is something really unique about this one because, right. Fluorescence is really determined by impurities within these crystals. They're called activators. And it, the, you can have different impurities that cause different levels of, or, you know, different fluorescence. Um, and just the same mineral with different impurities can fluoresce in different colors. Too much of an impurity can actually suppress it. And so there's, there's just so many factors going into this. Fluorescence is not necessarily indicative of any um one mineral so this could be one this could be many different kinds of minerals we'd have to wait for the full classification to see what it actually says regarding what all of these crystals are inside of this mm -hmm. and getty thank you so much where did this one fall i don't know if you said that or not if i heard you it fell in gujarat india fantastic man i really appreciate it you're welcome so that got us started off with the colors of the rainbow all in one meteorite 
But before we show individual examples of these rare colors in meteorites, figured you got to earn it, guys. So we're going to learn. Uh, we have Mike Kelly with his 101 on the colors of the rainbow in meteorites. And we're going to learn a little bit of the science behind it. And then later on, as soon as he's done, we're going to take a look at some of the examples from our collection that go across the entire spectrum. So, okay. Uh, so I kind of opened this up with a little bit of a joke. Uh, you know, Henry Ford, uh, his classic saying was, you could have it in any color you want as long as it's black. Well, meteorites come in uh, a little more colors than black, but for the most part, uh, your, your drab colors, your tans, your grays, your blacks, your browns, uh, your whites are what most meteorites uh, are as far as colors. And that's kind of indicative of uh, a lot of the conditions on the way that the majority of meteorites form, uh, right? So on Earth, you get a lot of colorful minerals, and that's because we're a very wet environment. We're a very oxygen-rich environment, uh, and space is typically neither. Uh, of those two things. And so you don't get a lot of things that we would call gemmy quality minerals uh, in, in meteorites uh, based on those formation conditions. So again, you got about 90% of all meteorites are ordinary chondrites. Uh, and in ordinary chondrites, you got a combination of olivine, uh, two different types of pyroxene, uh, and some plagioclase feldspar. Uh, and those kind of four major constituents are typically um, pretty drab as far as the minerals go. They're your browns, your grays, your tans, and your blacks. They're um, rocks. <laughs> yep, yeah, they're the major <laughs> mineral constituents of, of rocks. And like I said, most earth rocks aren't that impressive looking either. Likewise, on the achondrite side of the house, uh, you know, the achondrites, the majority of those are basalts. Uh, and basalts are fine grain. And we're going to kind of talk a little bit about how uh, the grain size has an effect on color uh, as the human eye perceives it. They're also not overly colorful. Topher's got a great shot here. These are some of the gem quality things you find on Earth with all sorts of fabulous colors as far as minerals go. And to understand what's causing those colors, you have to understand that it's not one single thing. Uh, so there's many factors that lead into uh, uh, the color of a mineral. Um, first and foremost, the actual structure of the mineral itself, the way the atoms arrange themselves, uh, has a baseline color to it. Tack on top of that, you get impurities that can get inside and in between the molecular structure. Uh, so you can do minor substitutions of impurities into the structure itself or just sitting in some of the void spaces. And those impurities, even down to um, billions of a percent, can create the color of a mineral. You then also get these interesting things going on uh, called intervalence change transfers. And we'll talk a whole slide on that. And that, that can affect color. You get natural irradiation. Um, so again, you know, rocks are out in space. They're, they're being, they have no atmosphere to protect them. They're being exposed to radiation uh, on the surface of these parent bodies. And the radiation energy that comes from that radiation can, can cause colors uh, to change inside certain minerals. And then finally, you get all sorts of other weird, odd effects. Uh, there's one picture in there. Uh, that's a piece of opal in there that has opalescence. Uh, and we'll talk about some different effects like that you see uh, that can occur in meteorites. When I first got into meteorites and saw the prices of them, I expected to cut some open and have stuff like this on the interior, and it doesn't happen. Uh, with one exception, I'll point out right off the top of my head, second row, chrome diopside. We're going to have an example of that later on. Yep. Um, so we, we talked about atomic structure and color. So the kind of interesting thing is uh, your transitional elements, uh, which are that kind of light purplish uh, middle part of the periodic table, that top row of the transition elements, uh, those are really very important when it comes to color. You got uh, titanium, chromium in there, manganese, you got copper, iron, uh, zinc, uh, to name a few of them. They have electrons in the d orbits, uh, and those d orbit electrons, when light hits them, they can get energized and bump up and down in the different uh, valence shells. And so when that happens, it produces, uh, it absorbs a certain color of light in order to gain that energy. And that absorption leaves different parts of the, the visual light spectrum left. And that's what your eye sees as refractance, right? So light goes into the atom, gets uh, certain wavelengths get absorbed by those D shell electrons and the rest of it gets reflected out and you're seeing what's left. 
Uh, so these are a couple of examples. Uh, this is actually from a Caltech EDU website. Um, and what was interesting about this was these were a lot of the examples on there uh, were actually meteorite examples. Uh, so uh, one of the people who put this uh, this bit of information together was uh, was into meteorites. So if you look at uh, Allende, um, some of the uh, clinopyroxene in Allende is actually kind of a greenish tint. Burns in uh, 1973 went ahead and studied that uh, clinopyroxene and found that the coloration in there was caused by titanium uh, three plus substitutions uh, into the normal clinopyroxene structure. So again, that's one of those cases where a little bit of that first row transitional metal elements getting into a material will change the look of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Likewise, uh, Topher mentioned uh, chromium diopside. Uh, again, that comes from chrome, uh, which is also in that, that same set of transitional elements. And when that goes and gets into diopside, which can be any color of the rainbow almost, the chrome in diopside turns to a very emerald greenish color. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you think of the megacrysts in ErgCheck 002, that meteorite gets its distinct green large crystals uh, from, from chrome 3+. And Mike, would um, that be the same reason why sometimes if you have a leaky hose faucet outside, the, um, there's a green around it? So that's most likely copper, right? Because a lot of the fittings um, are soft, malleable copper for, for hoses and things like that. And that brings up a very good point. When we look at color in the sense of natural light color, it's it's helpful to, to nail down certain minerals, but it's not uh, diagnostic, right? Because just from that example you had there, you can get the same kind of color feature um, from two different um, elements. And, and so it by itself uh, can't be used to peg down what mineral you're actually looking at. Awesome. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, no problem. Um, some of the other interesting ones that they pointed out would be like ringwoodite, uh, which is blue. Uh, ringwoodite is created by a uh, high pressure shock to olivine, uh, magnesium rich olivine. And what it does is it actually forces some hydrogen ions and some hydroxyl ions into the structure. So it's basically shoving uh, disassociated water into the olivine, and it's taking up some of the space that the iron would usually occupy in there. Uh, and that uh, displacement of the iron is what actually causes the blue color uh, in ringwoodite. But it's actually uh, it's a, a source of water in the, uh, the solar system uh, in the form of uh, bound up crystalline bound water in ringwoodite. And the final example I had on there is just, we, we mentioned colors. Uh, I had ruby and emerald on there, which are earth minerals. You know, they basically, what's interesting there is we talked about chromium three plus, which is the same thing that causes the green and chromium diopside. What's interesting is depending on where you put those um, molecules uh, and those atoms in, uh, in the crystal structure can vastly affect what color you see. So the chromium three plus in ruby is responsible for the red, but it's also responsible for the bright green color in emerald and chromium diopside. Uh, wow. It's just a matter of where it's sitting that causes a, a difference in the color shift in the uh, crystal structure. So I talked about impurities and series. Uh, so I'm just going to touch on this really quickly. Uh, impurities are where you have a very, very minor trace amount of uh, some uh, metal ion getting into the, uh, the crystal structure, and that's enough to cause the change. Uh, the difference between that and the series is a series is like a continuum. It's like an olivine, which we've talked about before, where you have magnesium and iron as the two end members, and there's some continuational uh, variance in the amount of each of those inside the, the standard mineral structure. Um, so both of those can have color effects, regardless of how much is going on. And for instance, Topher has a picture of a uh, red spinel in Tisolatine 001 over here on the right-hand side. Uh, and again, uh, spinel can come in various colors of the rainbow. Uh, this happens to have some chromium in it. And it's in this case, it's causing it to be red, uh, just like in the last example where the chromium in the ruby causes it to be red. So it's a very similar substitution. Intervalence change transfer. So this is kind of cool. Um, so when you have two atoms sitting inside of a mineral crystal next to each other if they have uh different charges to them so let's say one is titanium three plus and it's sitting next to an iron two plus uh, what they can do is they can exchange an electron between the two atoms 
And when that happens, it produces a color. So that's the uh, intervalence change transfer. Yeah, I'm super glad we have you uh, on our team, on our crew to explain these things to us. And again, I'll say I'm super happy I get to edit and listen to it six times because this is some very, it's needed information. It, it's a lot to take in. So those who are uh, listening along on YouTube, congratulations on sticking with it. No offense to you, Mike. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. This is this is kind of deeper science level stuff. Uh, yeah. Again, uh, irradiation was what we were talking about, uh, you know, cosmic radiation uh, bombarding the uh the atoms inside of a mineral. And uh, sometimes what that does uh, is it, it changes the structure. Uh, so we see blue halite in a couple of different meteorites, including Zag and Monahans. Uh, and what's happening there is what's called F centers. So sometimes you get imperfections in a crystal and those are called Faber centers or the most common ones. And what that is, is where a free electron just kind of sits in the structure where an atom should be. So you just have a loose electron sitting there. And as this radiation bombards it, what it does over time is it migrates from that free electron center to where a uh, Cl minus would be, a chlorine ion would be in a salt structure. And it knocks that out of place uh, and it allows that to then bond with sodium and you get a free sodium ion. So you got free sodium metal now sitting inside that, that crystal and mm -hmm. that free metal in there is what causes the blue color in uh, the blue halite you see in very rare meteorites. Yeah, I, I wish I saw a blue halite. <laughs> um, and this is kind of, uh, this is not really color. This is some of the effects you see. So when we look at things uh, like this, uh, this palisite, you see kind of the play of color going on in the olivine crystal. Uh, and that's called chitoyance. Uh, you'd get a little bit of iridescent uh, rainbow effect sometimes going on too on the crust of meteorites. Mm -hmm. um, and those can be caused by different uh, very thin um, uh, metal deposits on the structure that have a, a different refractance than the material underneath them. Uh, so it's the same effect for the iridescence as you get kind of on an oil sheen where oil sitting on top of water. Um, that chitoyance is that cat's eye effect that you see going on in the palisite next to there. Uh, and in meteorites, that's actually caused by like a micro tube structure of, of thin tubes going through the olivine. Um, and they kind of uh, change the way the light moves through the material and, and cause those brighter spots and a little bit of um, rainbow effect going on in there. Um, and then Getty yeah. touched on the fluorescence uh, uh, already, uh, which like you mentioned already, caused by activators in there. What's kind of neat about that is uh, the same thing that can cause that activation uh, if it's not in the right concentration, it'll actually um, act as a dampener. Um, so things like iron, for instance, uh, in albrights is a dampener. So a lot of the fluorescent albrights uh, are very, very low in iron content. Oh, I forgot this was actually a video. So you can see a good example of Chateauians there. You called it out. This is Admire. Yeah. So if you really want to have color be useful uh, in meteorites, um, that's where thin sections come in. So when you put things in cross-polarized light, the, act, the color and the order of that uh, color magnitude actually does become diagnostic to a degree to specific minerals. So by doing that, you, you turn color into a useful classification tool. And that's been something that's been around since 1808. So that's a very old component of uh, looking at mineralogy. Uh, and then in the 1830s uh, was when they first came out with the first petrographic microscope. Uh, and ever since then, it's been a useful tool for, for classifying minerals and rocks. Could imagine the first guy who looks through and sees that, man, because when I first saw um, it in stereo, it just blew my mind. Yep, well, uh, getting down towards the end. So I mentioned uh, size was also important. Um, so this is a sizing chart over to the uh, right. What it is is for sediments. That doesn't really matter what it's for. Um, the kind of the takeaway point is, as you see uh, at the top, you can clearly pick out things that are black class and things that are white matrix there. But as the size gradient gets smaller and smaller and finer and finer, uh, your eye loses the ability to pick that out. And it all just kind of becomes mm. gray. Same thing happens with color. You know, if there's two different things of different color right next to each other, but their size shrinks down to a smaller and smaller size, 
uh, again, it, you, your mind can't pick it out and it becomes a wash. Uh, and you kind of see a blend between the two. And so a lot of the things we have in meteorites are very fine-grained uh, rock structures. Uh, and so, again, you, you lose that color of the individual minerals uh, hmm. because you just see it all as kind of background mass. Wow. That was probably the simplest explanation I've ever heard of that, man. Kind of, this is just a kind of a personal list. I kind of picked out some uh, some meteorites that I thought stood out for colors. Uh, you had mentioned uh, Erg Check on there that stands out for the greens. Uh, some of the lunar crusts are interesting greens and tan colors. Not really caused by the meteorite, but you get a lot of very reddish soils down in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, so your henberries and your milbillilies uh, all have a very distinct color look to them. Um, I won't cover the whole list, but yeah, there's a lot of these were the ones that I kind of thought were standout color meteorites. Yeah, really super cool. And we're going to see some of these later on tonight. Awesome. Mike, thank you so much. I really appreciate that deep dive into the science behind uh, the colors we're seeing in meteorites and why we're not seeing them like geodes and clusters of amethyst. So thank you very much. Always a pleasure. All right. We are going to step into show and tell now with individual examples of these colors that Mike taught us about in examples that we have in our collection. So the first one is a, we're going to start and kind of do it in the order of a rainbow, Roy G. Biv. We're going to start with red, orange, yellow, green, blue. We're going to end up with purples and blacks and whites. All right. The first color on our fabulous trip is red and orange. So I think this is Mike. Is this you or? Yes, I did, Topher. That's mine. Uh, <clears throat> so it is a piece of Duja 001 albright. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the albrights are almost all instatite, and that's the nice white creaminess you see going on there. Uh, but there is some <laughs> sometimes in there. Uh, and so what you're probably looking at is, uh, is some sort of uh, iron oxide based material in there, either from weathering or, or uh, in the actual material itself. Uh, that's giving it that nice uh, reddish color. Yeah, and that is, that's a pretty good example, man, because there's not a whole lot of uh, orangish red and, and meteorite. So uh, that's Juatu 001 uh, and Albright. Um, and you can see, I wanted to show you what it looked like uh, just under regular light, not mm -hmm. backlit. Um, so this is a pretty thin slice. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see that big orange ish red spot up there uh but it really shines when you backlight it damn oh dude so you can see that uh yeah you get those slices thin enough uh they look beautiful wow yeah that's that's stunning man that's weird because my juato has a little bit of orange like tiny little imperfections in them but nothing like that yeah, that was a, a nice big spot. And uh, when I saw that, I knew I wanted to try to get it cut thin enough to uh, <laughs> to be translucent. Ooh, one of the most beautiful palisites. This one is uh, Hasi Elboed 002. And uh, I thought it captured the red and orange down here pretty well. So that's why I included that one. In Also in orange, we got a video submission from Ashley. So Ashley Humphreys. Hey guys, I've got some orange meteorite here. What I have is an H5. It is NWA 12001. This is a polished end cut. So there's that, it's really pretty mm -hmm. and um, I learned early on when I started cutting and polishing meteorites, you want to look for this like popcorn ceiling texture. Yep. You find pieces like that, um, even in like just a random NWA bucket, the inside's going to look nice. So here's what it looks like when it's polished. Here is what it looks like when it's not, uh, when it's Ooh. not polished. So hold on. Yeah, I just licked it. Don't judge me. But see the difference in the color? I tell you guys, too, go for the ones that have those bumpy outsides. They're, they're H's, and there's always something good on the inside when you, when you slice them open. Um, you also have a green one to share with us. 
So this is La Drunite, uh for the green. This is NWA 13507. Uh, and again, um, under regular visual light, not overly impressive, but you can see it's razor thin. That's uh, mm. 0.5 millimeter slice. Wow. And when you backlight it, there's yellows, but yeah. the real spectacular part's over here. Whoa. Oh, beautiful. Wow. So, yeah, there's a very, very green. Uh, I'm thinking it's uh, uh, pyroxene class in there. Wow. So that was my green. Very good, man. Thank you. Um, ooh, we got Marissa with green herb check. Do you want me to show the pictures you sent in? Yes. Okay. There All we right. go. So now Marissa checking in with the green. Yeah. So for the green, I decided to show Erg Chech 002. And I chose this one because it has these beautiful giant crystals of green that I I'm not very good at minerals yet in meteorites. They're very, very hard to learn, but I believe it's pyroxene or orthopyroxene. I know Mike would definitely know if I got that wrong. He can correct me. I, I actually, if, are you talking about the, the crystals like these right here? Yeah. Um, I could be wrong, but I believe those are chrome diopsides crystal. You could be right too. See, yeah. it, this stuff is so hard. Yeah. That I, I'm not versed yet on identifying minerals by eye and meteorites. Yeah. Well, I surround myself with smarter people than me. That way, uh, I look good by <laughs> osmosis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, that's All right. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Yeah. So, some really good examples. You can see the actual crystal structure. Really good. Yeah. And what's really special about this meteorite is that it is believed to be the oldest known volcanic rock that's ever been found in the solar system. So it, it's even older than the Earth. So it's believed that these came from a protoplanet. That is crazy. I, I know that, but I love hearing it every time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marissa. Definitely appreciate you sharing with us today. Blue 42, blue. Allison, blue. Allison, what you got for us whenever you're ready? Okay. What I have is a 32.76 gram NWA unclassified chondrate. And ooh, you can see there's quite a bit of blue up in here and throughout this vein. And then the matrix itself is quite blue throughout. There's quite a bit of metal in this piece, which I think is really pretty, but the blue is what ultimately caught my attention for this piece. I bought this one sight unseen from you just on the description alone. <laughs> so, but yeah, kind of an interesting piece. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that one. I, I remember that one. I took pictures of it. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah, that is very unusual. You know, we, we sometimes get sort of the gunmetal gray from NWA 869 and its, and its co-pairings, but this is a, much more of a blue. Oh, this is nothing. You guys haven't seen, I didn't tell you what I was doing for my blue. This is my bluest meteorite you're ever going to see. Oh my goodness. Uh, it's a Whoa. terrible, it's a terrible picture, but it's absolute fake. It's Photoshop, but that's bluest that's blurry. I was going to say, that's kind <laughs> of <crazy. laughs> That is the bluest meteorite you're ever going to see because it's absolutely fake. <laughs> figures <laughs> we're, we're kind of gonna cheat a little bit because there's not a whole lot of abundance of blues and purples and you know 
peacock colored stuff. So Marissa, uh, we're, we're kind of cheating, but we're using technology. Tell us what we're looking at, please. Well, what you're looking at is a thin section photo. And this is a photo from NWA 869. And it is of a giant barred olive conjo. And as you can see, the bars are very, very fine. Like they were so fine, I didn't notice them until I zoomed in. Hmm. Wow. I, I actually picked four of your pictures out to show that had the most purple and blue in them. And I think you did some lens and color shifting uh, tricks on these as well. Yeah, th this one is also from NWA 869. And it's another Bard Olivine conjo. And this has the full wave plate in it. And so that just alters the colors a little bit. I, I don't know exactly how mm -hmm. they work, but it, it just is... changes up the colors and you're seeing false images. And this is the regular cross polarized yeah. photo. Yeah, I wanted to I wanted to point out to everyone watching on YouTube that these are the exact same areas uh, under the microscope of the of the uh, thin section slide. You're just manipulating the lenses and the colors and and the orientation in the cross polarized light to get whatever colors you want artistically. Yeah. But this one you did something special on. Yeah, that's a split image that I created. I took that I took two different photographs of that area and one in regular cross polarized light and the other I added the full wave plate to get these beautiful false colors and cross polarized light is also false colors but they all just manipulate the colors and I combined them both to create this beautiful artwork image. Yeah. And that is, I'm glad you use the word art because I wanted to let everyone know that uh, we are working on a project with you, just helping you uh, promote your art um, and more coming soon. I'll just leave it at that. We'll just tease everyone that the best and most passionate thin section photographer on our crew may have something for your wall soon. So Marissa, thank you very much for that tour through blues and purples. You're welcome. Um, Pat, Purple Pat, are you ready? I am ready. I do want to let you know that we we you're, you're at a disadvantage after the little cheating we did with uh, Marissa. <laughs> your purple is not going to be 100% breathtaking, but it's 100% real. Go for yes. it. Yeah, so so this is um, unclassified NWA uh, that I that I will at some point be classifying, but currently unclassified. So Mike mentioned Hibonite in Murchison, uh, but Hibonite also shows up in in meteorites, uh, sometimes associated with CAIs, and sometimes associated with pre-solar grains. So so this is a really odd. Uh, rock that I bought direct from Northwest Africa. We're looking actually at the outside of the rock here. And I've got the, the uh, blade with the light. I've got the light intensity turned way down so that in the lower left there, right below the scale, we can see these two blue purple crystals. And I do believe these are hibonites. And I think you know, they, they could be associated with CAIs or could be associated with in individual uh, pre-solar grains. You know, this is this is real purple. This is straight up. When I first saw this, I thought, ah, it's got to be something on the rock. So I went in there and messed with it with a toothpick and such. No, those are actually purple crystals in a meteorite. And uh, this one will get cut at some point when I get done studying it. And I'm hoping I find more stuff like that inside. That is awesome. You have a concern when you're cutting this the normal way that you have to be uh, cognizant of. You want to explain that real quickly? When, when, when we cut meteorites, we want to do the least harm possible. So my, my initial concern was, are these halite rather than hibonite? And if in fact they're halite, then they're water soluble. 
but I've looked at them enough and played with them a little bit and even dabbed a little water on them. They're not water soluble, so they're not oh. halides, um, but rather are, I, I think, probably hibonite. And, uh, you know, when, when, when we saw a meteorite, uh, you know, we first want to do no harm. And so we use uh, distilled water or occasionally, like if meteorites do contain halides, we actually cut with isopropyl alcohol or flat out dry, yes. both of which are pretty dramatic. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Tucker. I appreciate it, man. That's really super cool. And uh, that's where a microscope pays out because you, you can dig in there and see exactly what you're looking at. But they were definitely purple. So thank you, man. Cool. We are on opposite end of the spectrum, I think, now with <laughs> white and black. So we added white and black to the schedule, uh, to the to the rainbow of meteorites. And we're going to check in with Carl and Diane. Right now we have Carl. Hi, um, guys. Um, what you got buddy uh, I've got a, a black one which in hand is actually very black it doesn't show up quite as black as it really is in the photograph but it's uh, a CM2 and it's the very first witnessed CM2 fall and even before the type specimen and it's called Bakkeveld from South Africa which fell on October 13th 1838 yeah Cold Bakkeveld is a very interesting CM2. It's got a lot going on, but it's a very black meter. I mean, it doesn't look so in the photograph, but this one is not quite half a gram. Oh. What's the classification on it? Because it, it It's looks a like CM2. CM2. And like I said, it's the very first witnessed CM2 fall, uh, even though um, the type specimen of CM's big eye fell in 1889, but they had to kind of retroactively classify this one. Huh. Wow, very interesting. Yeah, and it's like I said, it's it's pretty difficult to obtain. Now to the opposite end of the spectrum, we got <laughs> Diane with white. Yeah, and this is a piece of aubrace, which is the type specimen for the aubrites. Wow. And you can see those nice creamy white instatite crystals. Yeah, this one fell in France in 1836, which was a witnessed fall. I guess the first stone fell near a shepherd who picked it up and said, what's this? He took it back to his masters. I know, interesting. Cracked it open and put it on a mantelpiece. And 10 years later, some scholar looked at it and said, oh, that's interesting. Went in and bought it. <laughs> And it was estimated that it was originally just 800 grams, about 230 grams have been lost. So what's left, they, what's accounted for is 567 grams. And this is just over a gram. And our piece is just over one gram. Wow. That is really super nice. Yeah. Wow. I actually... Uh, I didn't identify it when I was putting the slide deck together, but it's funny because I chose some some colors as well to share with you guys. And I chose white and I chose an Albright. So uh -huh. there's Joatu 001, it's a 69 gram slice. And like Mike showed earlier, it, it does show these, these uh, orange inclusions. I'm wondering if this right here would have been translucent if it had stayed in place. Hmm. yeah um good question that's cool yeah. it's a nice piece that's a giant slice for an Albright. Yeah. <laughs> yeah very much yeah. so yeah uh that's it's nice to see the, the the crystal structure on the outside of the crust as well but we're only looking at the white parts don't look at anything else because it's that represents white <laughs> does anyone know what this one is at norton county nope it is not an Albright. Oh, wait a minute. Um, it's it's a lunar meteorite. There you have it. Yeah, it's lunar, but I don't know. Highland the Lunar. legendary uh, NWA 5000. Oh, oh gotcha, 5000. Okay. Yeah. So, that one is very black and white, yeah. Yeah, so I yeah, thought that was an interesting one. Uh, yeah, this one this one actually has a nice uh, a nice delineation line between it. Um, yeah, almost, almost it like a dualithology almost. Yeah, yeah. 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 We have dark black in the house. 
Yep. Yep. This is Zarev, uh, <laughs> a witnessed uh, Russian fall that was collected years later. So interesting story. It's a it's a it's a witnessed fall that they didn't find for a while, but it's very black on the inside, and it even has black chondrules as you can see right here. I forgot the uh, classification of that one. Yeah, me too. But it's on the screen right now for you for you as a uh, YouTube ease. Wow. When it came to yellow and orange and green, I thought, well, I got one for that. Is that 7831? Yep. This is a rare end cut of it. So you can wow, see what, cool. what the exterior looks like. Nice. It, it does have a... It does have a coating on it. That's what you're seeing there, that shine. If it didn't, it would have fragmented upon the saw. Right. Oh, I'm sure it would, yeah. I believe it. Wow. Yeah, but that, that's one of the rare ones that, that are yellow. And then once you illuminate it, you see it's, it's actually orange, yellow, green. It's like the, one of the most colorful meteorites I know of. Yeah, it's a yeah. very pretty one. That is nice. This is my example. I think this is the last one of the day. This is the example of yellow and green. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I see in some blood. black in there too. What classification is this, guys? Howard Hyde. Uh, Howard Hyde or Diagenite? It is a Diagenite. Yeah, nice crust. Yeah. yeah. Love that crust. But I must divert your attention from the crust. Do not look at the crust. Look at the yellow matrix and the green crystals. Ooh, oh, very pretty. pretty. Yeah. There is Mike's example of the Agenite for, I believe, yellow and green because there's all kinds of weird colors in there. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. So we there, there's a lot of other, I'm glad you brought that up because Tatooine uh, is, is one that uh, we definitely could have done. Uh, there's there's other if you guys know of any meteorites that make you think about a, a certain color, go ahead and leave that in the comments. Let's get a little discussion going. Cool. I thought it was a pretty yeah, interesting uh, um, geology and chemistry class today. Thought we had some uh, some great examples of the colors of the rainbow. All right, well, like I said, those are the colors that we found in our meteorites. Leave your comments down below with what you have in yours or, or if you think you saw something. Catch us again in a few weeks. Happy holidays, everyone. Thanks a lot. Good night. Good night. Night, night, everybody. Night, night. Night. Oh, I love it. Ooh. We're looking at a unclassified um, nickname, Golden Palisite from Northwest Africa. Yeah. Uh, and Chris Monk just dropped it. Now, Chris, <laughs> when you when you bought this, like, wow, look at that. It's just, it's shiny, dude. Uh, when you got this a week ago or a week ago, it was not, it didn't look this pretty, man. What'd you do? No, so I just cleaned it up just a little bit and then I etched it. And for those that have done some etching, this etched super fast like wow. some stones you want to have the acid on there for 45 seconds maybe a minute two minutes um but th this etched in like 15 seconds oh, wow. what was like ferric chloride or uh, nice yes ferric chloride wow so if anyone else etches it keep a close eye on it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i once i noticed it starting to change color i tried to get it off and i almost like let it etch too long. Mm. It looks it's, nice. It's striking. Yeah, it's I want to see if I could do this so you guys can see. Oh yeah, look oh, at yeah. that. Man. Nice, nice. That's wow. Cool. Some nice orange and yellow hues in there. Yeah. Very nice. Anyway, I just thought you guys would like that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Thank you done. so much for sharing that, man. No well, problem. All of those Martians are. Uh, predominantly green in their bulk color yeah and one color thing we didn't touch on was the and then you showed a, a number of uh, palisites but the continuum from green in the olivines to browns in the olivines where you've got magnesium and iron substituting for each other mm -hmm. knowledge bolide crew member smiley jeff was unable to join us live. Uh, he is in Canada. It is freezing up there, so stay warm, buddy. He wanted to share with us his 10-gram slice of Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon is a main group palisite, 
and his piece shows the deep purple colored crystal uh, olivine that this is known for. It's pretty interesting fact that the meteorite was found in 1868, but it wasn't officially recognized as a palisite meteorite until 1902. Did anyone miss Smiley? You betcha.